All right, today we're going to do a tutorial on Docker. And uh, so I, it took me a long time to kind of warm up to Docker um, for a number of reasons. First, the, but the main one is because there actually was not a lot of good information on how Docker worked and how, basically what was going on underneath. To me, it seemed um, that it was a collection of recipes that no one had really documented very well and uh, that no one had uh, really taking the chance to explain and therefore using it in a production system seemed problematic. And so what, one of the goals of this tutorial is to kind of remove a lot of the mystery around Docker, what it is and what it does and how it works. So um, one thing that I did is uh, I'm using uh, this terminal here is called cathode and it kind of gives you kind of retro -y looking uh, monitors, uh, shell, uh, shell prompts. And so, um, you know, you can tell me in the comments if that's, if, if I, I figured it'd be a little bit more interesting than just your standard shell, but on the other hand, it might be distracting. So let me know in the comments if you like it or if you don't. Um, so what we're going to be doing is I'm going to show you Docker from scratch. We're going to go from the very beginning. So, um, first I'm going to SSH into a brand new box that I've created, uh, on Linode. So, um, I'm gonna log in. So here I am on my brand new clean box that has nothing whatsoever on it. So all I'm gonna do is I'm going to install Docker. All right, so yum install Docker. Yes, I wanna install it. Um, so Docker runs as a service. So after it installs, you have to get it uh, started up. And so give this a little bit to finish going. There we go. All right, um, so now it's installed. And so now we just have to turn it on. So we do service docker start. Okay, and then to make sure that it runs, so this will start the service, and this is just standard uh, Linuxy stuff to tell you to start the service. Um, then to get it, make sure uh, Docker starts on on system startup. We can do check config Docker on, and that will make sure that when we reboot the system, that Docker is still running. So Docker, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Docker is a container service, and what a container is is it's like so. Um, you know, in with the, all these cloud computing, you can, I can go on to Linode and I can spin up a new box. Um, I actually have some t tutorials about that. Um, I can spin up a new box and I can log in. And um, basically what happened is that Linode has, has actually partitioned bigger servers into smaller servers. And then they have like a hypervisor that um, runs over uh, that, that, a hypervisor that that runs over the system and manages these partitions but really every time you install every time i partition a, a box up I, I install a full version of the operating system on each one and so really the different partitions um of a machine really act a lot like completely separate machines and that's good for some things um it's good that there's isolation that they can't uh, uh they can't overact uh, over interact with each other, um, but it's also it's not good from a resource sharing viewpoint. If you think about it, you have you for every partition that you make inside the server, you've got separate entire uh, disk space for your operating system. You have separate uh, copies in memory for your operating system. You just have a lot of redundancy that that happens. And so what Docker is is Docker is a container service. And what a container is is it's kind of like a virtual machine, but you're actually sharing the operating system. And so, um, and in fact, Docker has a lot of advantages and I'll uh, link to some articles below that I've written on Docker so you can kind of see what the advantages are. Um, but the other thing is that Docker also allows you to, to run a container as a command. So imagine uh, if you could run a command, it would spin up a box, it would do a process and then it would give you back results, right? Well, that sounds like it would take a long time. And, and if you were doing regular virtual machines, it would because you have to all the operating system, you'd have to do all sorts of things. 
with containers, that can actually be very, very fast. You can spin up a container, run a, uh, run a process, and terminate in less than a second. Um, so this is all, it's all very fast. Um, and so we'll go over it today. And, and co a container can be as big or as small as you want. You can actually have a container that literally only has one file in it that runs. I mean, some of, some of these starting containers, that's what they'll be. And so basically, if you imagine like, because um, technically to run, to run Linux, you actually don't need any files. You just need one executable that it starts up. In fact, if when you start up Linux, that's exactly what it does is that it boots up the kernel and then it runs exactly one command, which is the init command. So init does all the other stuff, but init could be something else. I actually uh, once uh, built a Linux dis distribution uh, that instead of init, it had, um, um, I forgot the name of the program. It's a, it, it's basically a terminal computer, uh, a terminal system. And so basically I, I, I turned an old laptop into a dumb terminal. Basically it would boot up Linux and it would go into a serial terminal. And, uh, and so there was no other files. There was literally just, um, you know, there was no, there's no file system structure. There was no libraries. There was no nothing. It literally booted the, the kernel and then it started up, uh, I think it was called Minicom or something like that, which is a, a serial terminal program. And so that's the only thing that it did. And so these containers can be that simple or it can have a full distribution of Linux in them. So it's, it's however you want to do it. Um, so anyway, so we've got Docker installed. So let's uh, talk about um, what we're going to do with it. So we're going to just run a simple Docker image. And so I'm going to, so this is a, this is a Docker image that I I've created, but you can, you all can use it. It doesn't, um, you don't have to be logged in as me or anything like that. Anyone can use it. It's a public image. So I'm going to do um, Docker run. And this is my Docker, um, uh, my Docker hub username, Johnny B61820 uh, slash hello world. So this is a Docker image that I made and it's very simple. So that what this will do is it'll go to, Docker Hub, pull down my container image, um, create a container. Uh, it'll store the image on the machine. It'll create a container for you using the image and it will run the container and then return. And so that's what all this does. So it says, it says unable to find the image locally. Okay. Um, and so because I didn't specify a version, you specify uh, versions, which are also called tags. Uh, they're after these colons and it defaults to colon latest if you don't specify one. Um, so it says unable to find this image locally. So then it goes to our Docker repository. So trying to pull repository docker.io slash johnnyb61820 slash hello world, pulling from there. And then it has um, the name of one of my file systems. It says pull complete. Um, and then it runs my command, which runs hello world. Okay, so this hello world is what my container does. All, that's all it does. It says hello world and then it exits. Now, if I run this again, because I've downloaded this now to my computer, if I run this again, it doesn't do all these other steps because it has it locally. It's there. Um, so um, now it just runs the container itself, which just says hello world. Okay, and we'll run it one more time just for kicks. All right, so um, there you go. We've run it three times. So um, now if we do Docker image LS, okay, so a Docker image is what we, is what we downloaded. That, that's this uh, Johnny B61820 slash hello world. That is the image. And it's basically um, a file system with a little bit of a configuration wrapped around it. Um, it tells the, it tells Docker uh, what files go in here and it tells it how, uh, what, what, command you run when somebody starts it. Okay. So that's the image. So I only have one image, but I've run this three times. So it's actually created three containers for me because a container, um, you know, you have the image, but then you also have, you know, if, when you use it, you're actually uh, modifying files. You might add files, you might remove files. Um, so the container has all the changes that you've used. And so Docker uses a really interesting service called union FS. And what UnionFS does is it is it basically creates layers to your file system. Okay, so each uh, so you have a bunch of read-only layers, and then your very top layer is read-write. And so you, what what this allows you to do is you can actually um, you can make 
it, it makes it so that you have these, these read write layers are unmodifiable. Now you can modify the files, but all of it happens in your top, uh, your top layer. So your top layer takes all the changes and, and it looks like you only have one file system, but you might have many, many layers that are all kind of stacked on top of each other. And then your final layer is read write and that's where you do all of your edits. And so your container, uh, by default, these are very lightweight because all these file systems are read only, um, but your changes are still available because you have this read write file system on top. Um, so anyway, so if I do a Docker container LS, so your image is what we downloaded, okay? But the containers are the things that were started, okay? Um, oh, I need a, so by default, Docker container LS lists running containers and none of mine are running, they all finished. If I do Docker container LS dash A, that'll show me all the containers, both running and non-running. Okay, and so now you can see that I actually have three containers. Okay, so even though these are finished, it created containers for them, and uh, so they're, they still exist out in the ether. And so um, you can see that they all use the same image. Um, they all running the same command. This is the command on the container. Um, they're created and they're all exited. Now they all have a, an ID. Okay, so this is the name, this is the ID of the container. Um, in my image, um, this is the ID of my image. Um, the other thing that you have is you have this names, okay? And so like I have Priceless Williams, Priceless Carson, Affectionate Pain. Well, just as on my image, I have this image ID, which is kind of machine readable, and then I have my own name for it. Um, the same thing happens with containers. You have the container ID, which is basically a randomly generated ID for the computer to use. But they also randomly generate um, these, uh, these names, and these are just basically, you can view them as machine names, because really, as far as the operating system con is concerned, it, it actually is kind of creating kind of a virtual machine. It's sharing a lot of components, but it actually has its own networking. Um, it is its own host name. Um, so it has its own, uh, it, some of them have their own IP addresses, their own ports. And so, um, so this is, this is the name of, uh, so if you want a friendlier name, one that you can remember, uh, you can actually give them your own name as well. You can, you can, if I, uh, there's a command line argument that will allow you to name your containers, but by default, it'll come up with a, a more memorable name for you. I think they usually have like an, an adjective and a noun or most of them. So. Affectionate Payne, Priceless Carson, Priceless Williams. Um, so these containers still exist, even though they're they're finished. Um, now, I um, if I want to to run a Docker command and have it remove its container once it's finished, I can add the dash dash rm flag. Uh, so here I do Docker run dash dash rm Johnny B six one eight two zero slash hello world. And so this will create a container, it'll run the program, it'll exit, and then that dash dash rm flag will cause it to remove the container on exit. So if I do docker container ls dash a, you can see it didn't add, add another container. If I don't have the rm flag and I run it, then when I do docker container ls dash a, it pulled in a new container called lucid habit. Okay, so as you can see, um, so, so if you have a container that just runs and then stops and then you're done with it, uh, throwing in the dash dash rm flag is, is helpful. Uh, now, most of the time we use containers that, are, that contain long running processes. Uh, might, you might be running a database in a container and that sort of thing. And in those cases, you really wouldn't want to remove containers when you're done. But if you have a container that runs, it finishes, and then it, it goes back to you, um, then um, um, then running uh, dash dash rm is, is the best way to go. Um, so that's one. Um, here's another simple one. I can do docker run johnnyb61820 slash roll dice. And so again, it couldn't find the image locally. So it went and pulled it from the repository. Um, it did the pull. Um, it downloaded it and then it ran it. And this one is another simple one. It just says I rolled a four. Now if I run it again, I rolled a four again. Now I rolled a three, I rolled a five. So now if I do Docker image LS, I'll get the images. Those are the things that I downloaded from Docker. 
And so uh, that's these two guys. I've got one for my roll dice, one for my hello world. Um, and uh, so these are, so each of these image names are called repositories. And so the repository has a tag, which gives you the version. Um, so, and then the docker.io, that is the registry. Okay, so you've got the registry, you've got the repository in the registry, and you've got the tag. And you've also got an image ID. Um, so, but if I do docker container ls-a, you can see that I've got, here's the ones that I just ran, which I ran roll dice because I didn't do the dash dash rm with them. Now, if I want to, I can clean all this up. I can do docker prune or docker system prune dash a, and that will delete all of my non-running uh, containers. Uh, so if you just do dash, if you just do docker system prune, it'll remove all of your non-running containers. If you add the dash a, it'll also remove all of the images. So if I do docker system prune dash a, it'll say, are you sure you want to do this? I'll say yes. And so now if I do docker container ls dash a, you can see that I don't have any. If I do docker image ls, you can see that I don't have any images either. All right, so that's kind of the basics. Um, now there's more that we can do, like we can run a service. Um, so I created one that's uh, just a simple web server. Again, it's just a one file container that has a web server that doesn't do too much. Um, so we're gonna do Docker, um, Docker run. Um, so in this, in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the dash P flag. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is called simple web server, okay? So it went, it pulled it, and now it's running. And notice it give me, didn't give me a command line back. And that is because um, it is, um, it's actively running. So it's, it's still running, it's, it's right here. Um, running in the, you know, it's, it's a web server, so it's just gonna keep on taking requests pretty much forever. So um, I can go to, uh, I can open up, um, can open up Firefox, and uh, we can take a look at um, what this looks like. So um, now I should explain this dash P. What this does is the service that I installed uh, is running a web server on port 8070, okay? But I want it to run on port 8080. So what this says is it takes, says take port 8080 on the main machine and proxy it to port 8070 on the container, okay? So if I go to, um, if I go to my web browser, I go to the address, colon 8080, you can see here is, that's all, the, that's all the web server does. It just says that if you go to the root address. So I can reload it. Every time I reload it, it'll keep on giving me that same result. And if I stop it, then if I reload, it can't find it because it's not there anymore. Okay, now it's not ideal to uh, run services in the foreground. Okay, so we wouldn't need to be able to, to do that in the background. And so there's a dash D flag, docker run dash D. Um, and so we'll run our web server in the background. Okay, so now it's running. It gave us this, which is, is its image ID. Now, when you do docker, or not image ID, that's its container ID. When we do a list of containers, now this time I only have to do ls. I don't need the dash a because this is actively running. So the, the actual container ID is hugely long, but it just gives us a shortened version. And it's, it's fine, you can use the shortened version as long as it can figure out what you're talking about. Um, you can use either one. The, um, so this is the container, it's running, and I can still access it here. Um, oh, I forgot to proxy the ports. That's why it's not running. So I'm gonna stop this container. I'm gonna do docker stop and then the container. Okay, so, and then I'm, I'm gonna do uh, docker system prune to get rid of that one. Um, so 
Now if I do docker container ls, it's no longer there. So I'm going to run this again and I'm going to proxy, I'm going to remember to proxy my port this time. P 8080 is going to go to 8070. So it's going to run it in the background. It's going to proxy that port. Um, so I do docker container ls and notice it's going to tell us in here that I've got port 8080 proxied to port 8070 on the container. So now if I go here, I reload and you can see now it's working. Now 8070 will not give me anything because this 8070, that is only running on the container itself, not on the main host. That's why you have to use that dash P to get it to, to go. So I've got Docker, um, so I've got this container, I can stop the container, right? Docker stop um, and then I'll give the can container ID and now I'm going to do a docker container ls dash a because it stopped, otherwise it won't show. Um, and so now we can see that this container is stopped. It still exists. Um, I can tell it to run again with docker start. Now I still need to give the port proxies. Um, so 8080 80, 80 to 80.70 and then give the container ID, and that will restart the container. Um, oh. Docker start, I just need to start it. Yes, so I just need to start it. The do it already knows that it remembered that it was uh, how I had proxy that port, so I just had to start it back up. So uh, Docker start, um, actually I'm gonna, That's right. Um, so Docker start restarted my container. It restarted it in the background. Um, now I can restart it in the foreground. So I can do Docker container, or no, it's just Docker stop. Docker stop, and then the ID, and then I can do Docker start dash A will attach me to its standard in and out. Um, I can restart that container, and now I'm running in the foreground. Now, if I hit control C here, it's not gonna show up in my list because it's not running anymore. I hit control C and I stopped it. I hit control C while it was in the foreground and I stopped it. But if I do dash A, you can see it going. So I can start and stop this all day long. So I can have, I can have different containers. I can have a database container. I can have a web server container. And you may be wondering why containers rather not just have individual applications. The reason for it is that a container uh, the container fully isolates these guys. So they literally are running um, their own configuration. So you don't have to worry when you run containers about whether or not I've got the right version of the operating system. Does this play nicely with that? Um, maybe they, maybe one of them requires one version um, of a command and the other one requires another version of a command. Uh, maybe one of them is using the BSD utils and the other one's using the GNU utils. Uh, there's, there's, all sorts of configuration issues that go away when you use Docker because these containers pretty much act like fully isolated systems. And so um, running them containerized uh, makes configuration management a lot easier because you're literally, and also if you go from, you know, if you have, if you have a development environment, a staging environment and a production environment, you can verify that your production environment is exactly the same as your staging and development environments. Because think about it this way, like let's say somebody puts a patch on the server, right? Um, let's say they put a patch on staging and they forget to apply it to production. Well, that doesn't happen here because your container contains all of, it basically contains what is essentially a full operating system, even if it's just one file. It contains all of the, all of the details. And so um, by putting things in containers, if I test it on staging, I'm getting that exact same image onto production. This is the exact same machine that I'm deploying. So um, anyway, so that's a service. Um, now you can run, um, the, as I said, the, these, uh, these services we've been running are pretty minimal. They're basically one file containers where the files, uh, uh, these files are executables that have uh, they're statically linked, so they don't have any dependencies on libraries or anything like that. So they're pretty simple services. But you can actually have pretty complex things. As I mentioned, you can actually have a whole operating system. 
So there's a, there's a standard uh, container um, called Ubuntu. And so if I just do docker run dash IT Ubuntu, then that will actually download a, a slim down Ubuntu install. And now I went, I'm, I'm not a command line again, but notice that my command line has changed. Okay. I used to be root at li 74-253. I'm now root at 43DD54F2B478. Okay, so that I've switched. I'm now on my Docker container. So what this Docker container is, is that it's a, it's it's literally Ubuntu, and it's set that when you run it, it runs uh, it runs the standard shell. And now I had to add this dash it here because without it, um, it doesn't know it doesn't allocate a terminal. So uh, it just does basic input output and not terminal input output. So I wouldn't have like colors like here. If I do an ls, I get these colors and things like that. It's super bare bones if you don't run with the dash it. Dash it allows you to really treat this as a terminal. So now um, I'm on a container that is a copy of Ubuntu. And so this has its own set of users. It has its own set of libraries. If I install something on this container, it doesn't install it on the host operating system. If I create a user on this container, it does not create that user in the host operating system. These are these are fundamentally different computers. So I can do, um, so just as a simple command, like uh, there's the UUID command that generates a UUID for you. And um, that command's not here. I can get it with my standard apt-get. So first you have to do an apt-get update uh, so it can download all the lists of where the programs are. Then you do apt-get install UUID. That'll go find the UUID package, it'll install it, and it's now on my machine. So um, now if I run UUID, it'll generate me a UUID. And remember, I'm still on my container, right? So this is all uh, being contained in kind of a self-contained system. Um, so this is, as I said, it's a full operating system. Now if I leave it, then it's, um, if I do a Docker container LS, you won't see it, but if I, because it stopped. If I do an LS-A, you can see um, that it, that it's running. So, um, or not that it's running, but that it has run. So there it is. Dazzling Hawking is what it called it. So I can do, um, so I can reattach to it. I can do Docker start dash a, I can give the container ID, or I can also give the name Dazzling Hawking. Right. So now I'm back. It restarted the container with the containers, um, uh, running the containers command. Um, so anyway, I can I can install like an I can install a uh, I can install install a web server. Have to get install. I don't know what they call it on on uh, Ubuntu. Is it Apache? Maybe maybe not. What's it going to give me? Maybe it's each, nope, oh, yeah, I hit control C, so it got me all the way out. Um, I think it's probably still in the middle of working. Yeah, so I'm gonna stop this container, stop. Dazzling Hawking. I think it got confused when I hit Control C. It didn't know that which which thing I was stopping. So I'm going to start it again. Container start dash a Dazzling Hawking. Help if I could spell it right. There you go. Hmm. Oh, you know what? I think I know what this is. I did not give all of the correct um, commands to Docker start. Um, I actually need to add a, let's stop this again. Docker start dash AT to get a terminal. Dazzling Hawking. So it didn't, it was, actually was ignoring my actual AI. I always forget my, I always get my command line arguments messed up. 
document docker start dash ai dazzling hawking there we go now we're working so now i'm going to do my apt get install apache 2 um so yes i want to install so now it's literally installing a web server onto my um onto my docker image um let's see here and again, this is going on the Docker container. I, I shouldn't say it was installing on my image. It was installing it on my container. So now I've got, literally, I've got Apache on my container. It, it's not on the main, the main server. It's on the container. Okay. Now I can actually, if, let's, so let's say that I'm wanting to configure something. Let's say I want to, I want to, I've got my own requirements for what I want on, on a machine. Well, I can use containers for that because what I can do is I can download Ubuntu. I can then install anything I want, set it up however I want. And then when, I'm, when I've got it all the way that I like it, um, what I can do is I can, um, let's see here, I can, um, what is it? Docker commit, that's the, I can do Docker commit. And then I can say, um, I can, um, oh, I need to do this. I'm currently in the container. I need to, exit out of the container. So exit out of the container, um, docker container ls dash a. So I'm on this dazzling hawking one. So I can do docker commit, and then I'm gonna do a uh, dazzling hawking, and then I'll do my custom Ubuntu. And what that will do is it will take the container and create a new image that's got the base layer, the base image that it was using, and then it'll have all the files that I had changed with uh, my container layered on top of that in a separate file system. And, and it'll have that into an image. And so now if I could create a, I can create containers with those things uh, layered on each other as an image, and the new container will then have a read write layer on top of that, okay? So now I have my custom Ubuntu and I can create, uh, so I can do docker run um, dash it uh, my custom Ubuntu. And so this is now creating a new container based on my previous image. So if you remember when we first installed Ubuntu, it didn't have UUID, but this one does because that it's based on an image that has it. And the other great thing is that this doesn't use up very much disk space. I've actually barely used any at all because that Ubuntu image, well, it keeps the, it, it has stored the uh, a hash code for each image. So it knows that that image uh, is the same. So even though I'm creating new and new containers, I can take, uh, and new, even new images, these images don't take up very much room because the base layer, the Ubuntu layer is staying the same. Since these layers are all read only, um, it's simply it's simply marking each layer marks the changes over the previous one. So even if you remove files, it's simply marking that they're removed. And so you can still keep all of the layers in read only form. And so it's actually winds up being a very efficient way of uh, of uh, of of creating these these images. So I basically only have to store the Ubuntu image once, and I can create I can create um, custom Ubuntu images. I can create customized, customized images, and all of that doesn't take hardly any space at all. And I can create hundreds of machines with these images. And it, again, doesn't uh, take up hardly any space at all because all I'm doing is storing the changes. So in fact, I'm gonna run, um, I'm gonna create lots of these. So we'll just run more. And every time we do this, we're creating more and more um, containers that run, oh, actually, they go too far. Maybe not. Yeah. So I um, every time I do this, I'm creating a whole new container that's got a it it acts like it has a full copy of the operating system, but because of the way that it's structured, it actually uses up hardly any disk space whatsoever. So now if I do a Docker container ls dash a, you can see that I've got all of these all of these different uh, containers that I've started up. Um, but I mean, I, I don't have a whole lot of disk space on this machine, but it, it's using each of these um, 
I, I kind of looked into it and, and a container by itself um, that doesn't have any changes on it uses up about 200K worth of, worth of data. So um, that's 200K, not 200 megs, 200K worth of, uh, worth of data. So I can just keep on creating these until the cows come home and it's not, it's not impacting my memory usage. It's not impacting my disk space usage. Um, it's very, very resource friendly. So um, now the, the one problem with creating containers like this is it's kind of a manual process. And if, if you've ever created a customized image, you know that you know, later someone's gonna come out with a new version of Ubuntu. So you're gonna need to go and create your new customized version of, of Ubuntu. Um, and the problem is you're gonna forget all the things that you did, okay? So instead of just going in and, and doing stuff uh, manually and then creating images out of it, the best way to do it is to make a recipe. And recipes are called Docker files. So I'm gonna create a little directory. Um, I'll just call it Docker. So I'm gonna go into this directory. So now I'm on the host computer again. This is not one of my containers, this is the host computer. And I'm going to create a Docker file. You can use whatever editor you want. I'm a VI junkie, so. Um, so the way that you do this is you say uh, from Ubuntu. Okay, and what this says is that we're gonna start with the Ubuntu image. Then we're gonna say run, because remember, what was the first thing that we did? First thing we did is we ran app get update. So we're gonna say run app get update. And then we're gonna say run app get install. Um, and actually we need a dash Y on these because this runs non-interactively. Um, app get um, install UUID. And so that installs the UUID package. Um, and then I can actually have it copy files from my, um, I didn't go over that, we'll go over it in a minute. I can copy files back and forth from my host computer to my container. So we can copy a file called my file. I can copy it in path to my file. Um, and then I have to give it an entry point. And the entry point is what it runs when you actually uh, do start the container. So it runs the shell when you start the container. And so it might, it might run a custom, like if you had a container that had a, let's say it had Apache and a database and memcache, you could actually have your own custom script that the entry point would run. And it would run, turn all those things on and do whatever you want. But the entry point says, what do you, what, what, what happens when you start this guy up? All right, so that's our Docker file. And so um, as, as I pointed out, this mean needs a file called my file. And so I'll create a file called my file. This is my file. All right, so now to build this, I do just do docker build. And I need to give it a tag, um, which is I need to name it. Um, so I'll call it uh, my image colon latest. And then I have to give the path that I'm building from. So that's current, current folder, all right? And so now it's going to do all the things that I told it to do. And it's going to create a new container from this recipe, okay? or new, not a new container, a new image from this recipe. So I need to get my terminology straighter. So now if I do docker image ls, I now have, uh, I call this my image, and there it is right there, my image. So now if I do a docker run with an interactive terminal, uh, my image, so starts with a shell prompt, um, it should have UUID installed, which it does. It should also have that my file installed. So I'll go, it was in path. Now this doesn't do tab completion. Path to, and there's my file. If I cat my file, this is my file. And there you go. So that is, uh, um, so you can see you can easily create these containers from these recipes um, that tell it how to run. So, um, Let's hear, oh, I was just gonna show you how to manually copy a file. Um, so you can copy files into containers. You can't copy them into images because images are read only. But you can copy them into containers. Um, so we'll create a file called my other file. This is another file. And then we'll look at the currently um, docker container ls-a, that's too many. Let's just clean this up. So we're gonna do docker 
uh, system prune. Gonna get rid of all of our stopped containers. All right, so now we're gonna uh, just run an Ubuntu container. Run Ubuntu. Um, I, I forgot to run it. Interact. Well, it doesn't matter. Docker uh, container ls a because it created the container. So we've got this new container called Elastic Booth. And what we want to do is we want to copy um, this file called my other file into the container. So you just do Docker cp my other file and then the name of the container so that would be elastic booth colon where you want it slash wherever slash my other file and this oh um i think i got the syntax wrong hold on just a second I had notes on this there we go uh, the path may need to exist already. So we'll just do slash my other file. There you go. It's happier now. Um, so it couldn't auto create that directory. But anyway, you can copy files. You can copy directories. Uh, it doesn't really care. So now if I do docker uh, start dash AI um, elastic booth, then in slash, uh, we should find my other file. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, oh, I'm not, didn't actually start me in the container. Docker start dash AI plastic booth. Docker. Sorry about this. Um, to, to, maybe it's, oh, but, no. let's try stopping it. Docker stop, elastic booth. We'll do docker start dash AI elastic booth. Hmm, it's not running. Um, Docker run. It's probably maybe I didn't run it dash it the first time. So I'll do a Docker system prune. I'll do Docker run dash it Ubuntu. So there we go. It's running. I'm going to exit out of it. I'm going to do this copy. Copy command. There you go. So, no, oh, it's no longer called Elastic Booth. Uh, Docker container ls dash a. This is inspiring Keller. Okay, so Docker cp my other file to inspiring Keller colon slash my other file. And now we'll start again. Start dash ai inspiring. Keller. There we go. Now we're on it. And you can see my other file is right there. So anyway, um, so that's kind of an intro to how Docker works. You can, as you can see, so you've got kind of recap. Uh, the uh, main concepts are that you have images and images are kind of the boxes, the, 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 they're the operating systems that you want to install. And the images contain layers, okay? They have these read-only file system layers that are combined together. Um, and they look like one file system to you, but the fact that they're layered means that they use up less space as you create um, options to them, as you create modifications to them. And then you've got your um, container itself, which takes your image layers and installs them read-only. It goes to the entry point of the image and runs it, and then it adds a read write layer to the top so that um, so that you can so that you have your working space and you can do anything that you want to the container um, it just but it only records it in the top layer um, and so this allows an extremely efficient usage of resources it's extremely flexible because every single container can have its own customized uh, 
version of Linux. In fact, you can you, you can run different distributions. Uh, there's a distribution called Alpine Linux. In fact, let me just show you docker run dash it alpine. So this will create a different uh, distribution of Linux uh, called Alpine and give me a, a container in there. So anyway, so you can see that there, this is extremely powerful uh, and, it's, and it's pretty straightforward to use. Um, there are some, uh, when you start trying to coordinate containers, you get a little bit more, um, a little bit more issues um, and uh, a little bit more complexity. But on, on the whole, uh, these containers are pretty straightforward um, and it's pretty easy to uh, create a container, create an image based off of a container, um, and then you can use Docker Hub is where you can store your containers. And so um, to store a container, you just have to name it. Um, when you create an image on your local machine, you just name it according to your repository and then do Docker push and then the name of your container. And actually, before you do that, you have to do Docker login. And it'll ask you for, oh, I'm, I have to do that from the host. Do Docker login. It'll ask you for your login information. You do Docker push. And then it's going to be your username, in my case, Johnny B61820, slash the name of the image. The image name. Actually, this whole thing is actually the, the name that you give it locally. You give it the name. Johnny B six one eight two zero slash the image name, and then you can push it, and you can give it an optional uh, version tag. So you can call it. So latest is the default. You can say zero dot two dot three. Um, however, you want to tag it. The idea is that it's the same, it's the same basic image, just with a different version. So anyway, um, I hope you en enjoyed this introduction to Docker. I hope you understand a little bit more about what it is, how it works, and how you can use it. I'll see you all next time.